So in this week's lectures, we'll look at what we call surface structures. These are structures typically concrete, although we'll look at some tensile structures that are in fabric as well, that rely on the flow of forces across their surfaces, right? Instead of um, perpendicular to the surfaces, these are structures that work basically by uh, forcing loads to flow over their surfaces. We'll look at mostly concrete, uh, typically shells like the one you see here, and we'll talk about both a little bit about the mechanics of how they uh, work. We won't get into too much math because they get uh, very complex very quickly. Uh, and we'll also talk about the difficulties in forming them. The one principle uh, that really defines shells uh, is double curvature. And even though that's a great thing structurally, it's often a very difficult thing to build. Um, surface structures are predominantly a 20th century phenomenon for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that they rely on materials that are good in uh, both compression and tension, uh, and therefore they require the steel that we didn't really have to work with until the, the 19th century, the late 19th century. Um, and they also require very complex formwork in the mathematics, uh, of course, to, to deal with the complicated uh, shapes that, that we'll look at. The benefits are that these structures tend to be very thin. They're very agile geometrically. We can uh, make almost any shape we want, so long as we take care of a couple of uh, parameters. And as you can see, they're super dramatic. They have this kind of uncanny uh, thinness, this uncanny lightness uh, that's very attractive, both to engineers uh, and to architects. So we'll look at four topics, uh, four uh, little lectures that will build up to an understanding of surface structures. In this one, we'll talk specifically about double curvature, and then we'll go on to a general discussion of shells. We'll flip those shells over and look at what happens when tension instead of compression is the main force within these. And then we'll talk about ways to kind of hack them, to, to take uh, advantage of several different structural uh, techniques when we add them together as we've come to expect, we get synergetic effects that make for much more efficient, much more effective structures. So to start with, what do we mean by double curvature? <clears throat> this is really the fundamental principle behind shell design, is that when we uh, create a surface that is what we call undevelopable, or, uh, uh, or that has basically, that can't be unfolded easily, um, we get a phenomenal amount of strength from a very small amount of material. The way to think about this, if you look at the, these diagrams, the difference between uh, a structure that can work as a, uh, as a shell of the kind that we'll talk about, a surface active shell that we'll talk about, is that it is quote unquote synclastic. You can trace two different curves uh, on its surface. This is different from what we call a developable surface, where there is just simply one curve, usually an extruded curve. And here you can see we have the difference uh, on the top between uh, a dome and a vault. And if you think about this, the dome is analogous to an eggshell. The vault is analogous to like a paper towel roll. And if you look, you can see that the synclastic or doubly curved structure uh, has two very distinct curvatures, one in section uh, and another in plan. The developable surface really only has uh, one curvature, right? It is curved only in one axis, and it is, that curve then is extruded to create the vault shape, but it's extruded along a line that is straight, that is not curved. And if you imagine, it's very easy to uh, bend or unfold a developable surface like a paper towel tube um, to unfold a synclastic structure, a doubly curved structure, uh, you actually have to break it, right? You're relying on actually uh, crushing or splitting uh, the, the fibers of the material you're working with. We'll look uh, at some more complex shells that are what we call anti-clastic. So this is curvature that goes in opposite directions. And you can see that in the short direction, this anti-clastic structure has uh, a positive curvature, frowny face. And in the longitudinal direction, it has a negative curvature, a, a, a smiley face. And because, again, those curves are different, uh, in this case, they go in different directions. Uh, that anti-clastic structure is impossible to unfold without actually breaking the structure. We'll look also at freeform uh, uh, structures and, and what happens when we introduce curvature along a number of different 
uh, axes, we can take advantage of, of many of the same uh, doubly curved uh, principles. So this is our fundamental distinction. Is it curved in one direction, in which case it is a vault, and we have a lot of work to do to prop that vault up to keep the horizontal uh, thrust from allowing that vault to unfold? Or is it doubly curved? Uh, can we get away with uh, without really all of the, the buttressing and things that we've come to expect from, uh, from a vault? Uh, is it some, a, a structure whose geometry means that to uh, make it unfold, we actually have to break it apart. And you see here on the right a very typical tension failure around the base of a dome when it's subjected to a, a gravity load from above. The double curvature principle, though, applies to a huge variety of shapes. So you can see, again, the difference between what we call a synclastic structure, where the curvature uh, is different, but both going in the same direction. In this case, both positive curvature, both frowny faces, and an anti-clastic structure where the curves are going in the opposite direction. One is positive curvature, one is negative curvature. Both of these count as double curvature, so they are both shell structures. They both have this uh, kind of uncanny lightness because they're relying on uh, the, the continuity of the, of the material itself. If you think about it too, uh, these also rely on two very different types of stress within them, or the, the capability of, uh, of dealing with two different types of, types of stress. If you think about what's going on in a dome, when you're pushing down on that eggshell, um, there are two sets of forces that are kind of intertwined. Um, the dome is going to experience compression along its radial lines. It's going to take the weight of your hand pushing down on it, it's going to, to direct those along the surface of the dome uh, around and down to the base. But then if you look at the way that that dome is failing, the way that the eggshell is failing when you push down on it, you can see that it is also experiencing tension. And the tension is basically going around the dome. It's what we call hoop stress. Um, that tension is required to hold the dome together. So two different stresses compression going down radially, tension going around the dome circumferentially. And if you think about it, those two different stresses are going in the directions of the two curves. So same thing goes for, uh, if, if you look at uh, the, the synclastic structure, we're going to have uh, on, 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 in one direction, it's gonna to tend to carry the load that we're putting on it in compression. In another, it's going to try to split apart in tension. And we can pretty well guess where those are going to be, but you can see that these are going to have to be reinforced uh, concrete structures because they'll have to deal with both forces, compression and tension. You can see in figure five, we'll get to some uh, fairly exotic shapes. Um, a, a conoid, for example, is uh, a, a doubly curved structure that goes from a, a curved or an arch shape to a flat shape, and you can see here that, again, there, there are these two different ways that the surface is curved, therefore two different ways that the, the structure will uh, experience stress, compression along the direction of the arch, tension along the opposite curve uh, going in the, in the longitudinal direction, more exotic things like hyperboloids, uh, or the potato chip structure that you see on the bottom, a really, really interesting one that we call a hyperbolic paraboloid. And again, there you can see there are two different directions uh, that the curvature is going, and therefore one direction that will be in tension, one direction that will be in compression. Woven together, notice, right? So even though we have a similar pair of stresses as we do in a beam, something that bends, here those stresses are actually traveling along the surface of the structure instead of being differentiated across the section of the structure. So if we go back, we've done this a couple of times now, but it's good to go back and, and review what, uh, what, a, what a surface structure is not, right? And the, the Pantheon is our great example of something that looks like a dome, but actually behaves very differently. Pantheon is really instructive though, when we start to think about where the, the various stresses, where the compression and tension are located within a structure. The Pantheon, remember, fails or, uh, or cracks along these radial lines. 
and uh, Robert Mark was the was the one who noticed that as soon as you get all of these cracks in the dome, it's not really working like a dome. It's working like a series of disconnected arches. And this is exactly the thing that differentiates uh, a, a, a vaulted structure from a surface structure. The forces or the stresses in the Pantheon are basically going just radially. The Romans didn't have the steel that they needed at the base of the dome to handle the hoop stress, to handle the tension that's trying to split the dome apart. Instead, what they typically did is they built very thick, very heavy buttressing walls. And you can think of those walls basically like uh, a whole bunch of arch buttresses that are arranged radially. That is very different from uh, these, er these shell structures or, or uh, true domes where you have the capability of taking the tension at the base of the dome that's trying to basically split the dome apart. So a couple of sort of counter examples to the Pantheon to show how this works. Um, here, Eduardo Torroja, a Spanish engineer that, that we've looked at before. This is one of his early works for a market hall uh, in southern Spain. And you, if you look closely, you can see that, first of all, it's a very, very thin shell dome. And Troja has developed these kind of eyebrows, these arches uh, at the facets of the, the dome. It's an octagonal plan. Those eyebrows are actually working like horizontal beams, right? Taking the, the thrust or the, the tendency of the, of the dome to flatten out and giving it some resistance, taking uh, that outward force down into the, the columns around it. But then if you look too, you can see that there are these uh, these kind of ring beams at the base of the dome that go between the octagonal points. And those are full of uh, tension steel, right? Full of reinforcing bars that are holding the dome in, right? Preventing it from flattening out. If you think about it, uh, and if you look at the, the diagram down here, dome stress trajectories, or maybe easier to see the, the dome reinforcement, you can see that Troja is concentrating that reinforcement, concentrating the tensile resistance down at the base where this hoop stress develops, right? The tendency of the dome to spread out, to crack, to, to fall apart. It is very different from the stress that is going radially along the surface of the dome. It is taking basically the dead weight of the dome itself and transferring it first to these uh, edge beams, and then finally into the compression elements that actually hold the dome up. So again, two stresses, right? One that is compression, pushing the dome together, and then at the base, uh, around the outside, uh, tension that is basically uh, trying to split the dome apart. And if you think about it, this, is, this to me is a, is a good example to remember that a tension ring around the base that's literally holding the corners of this particular dome uh, together. And that's something that we'll look at constantly, right? Where uh, do we need a, a secondary structure or a tension structure that forces the dome to hold its shape and therefore allows the dome to resist the compression forces that are flowing basically along its surface down to the supports. Uh, here, another uh, uh, slightly later example, uh, the basketball arena at the University of Illinois. Uh, where there's, this was a 400 foot span largest uh, diameter reinforced concrete dome in the world at the time. And you can see there are a lot of clever things going on. It has this kind of hybrid. It's a folded plate for sure. Uh, and you can see that it goes from uh, about just over a foot thick at the base to very, very thin, three and a half inches at the, at the top. And that tells us that this is surely a surface structure, right? It, it's not relying on the mass of the dome as it is at the Pantheon uh, to carry the thing. And if you look, here is the kind of key thing right here, post-tension ring beam, 590 miles of steel wire that are wrapped around the base of the dome. Uh, and then when the, the concrete was all poured, they literally cinched that together, tightened it up. The top of the dome rose about six inches and that tension ring beam is basically uh, preventing the dome from flattening out, from cracking, uh, from turning into a series basically of radial arches. Now, interestingly, the, um, the, the compression stresses in the dome, of course, flow radially. So they follow these folds as they come down to the base. 
And the folds are there literally to sort of balance any uh, asymmetrical uh, loads from wind, right? They, they recognize that this dome is so big and so thin that it's very likely to go into bending when the wind hits it from one side or another. So the folds are there basically to stiffen the dome, right? To take any of those uh, localized wind forces. The main behavior of the dome, however, is to channel the compressive the compressive loads uh, radially, and then to have this giant 590 mile steel cable that is uh, taking care of the hoop stresses, the tension at the base, right, where the dome is trying to kind of flatten out uh, and spread out. So a, a couple of good examples to show the kind of difference between uh, a, 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 a simple kind of uh, radial arch structure, which is what the Pantheon is, and then how a surface structure actually works, like the Taroha Market Hall uh, or like the Assembly Hall uh, at Illinois. And there are other classic ones that we can look at too. Nervi's Palazzetto della Sport, 1957 in Rome, uh, has uh, behaves very much like a dome. It is eggshell thin, uh, just three inches. You can see that those three inches are stiffened with this lamella pattern, and we'll come back to that when we talk about uh, kind of hacks. Um, but you can see that Nervi has been very clever about how he handles the, the tension stress at the base. Um, this sort of pie crust edge provides a, 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 stiff, um, a stiff edge to the dome, uh, but you can see that there's no way to get an actual tension ring around the base of the dome. So Nervi basically picks the dome up, puts it on these raking buttresses, and those buttresses take both the uh, vertical weight of the dome, but also the tendency of the dome to spread out. And they provide this resisting force that thrusts back, basically. And uh, those uh, buttresses are connected to a tension ring that's actually buried. So unlike the basketball arena at Illinois, where you have the 600 miles of steel cable up in the air, the, the steel cable here is actually buried in the earth, and there we can rely on the resistance of the earth uh, to take care of some of that thrust. Um, but you can see, too, that uh, those buttresses are going to stabilize the dome's base, they're going to hold it in place, and the dome is going to carry its own self-weight via compression radially out from the, from the center of the dome itself. The dome doesn't necessarily have to be complete. Uh, as we saw in the Toroja Market Hall, so long as we have a, a spherical section, um, we're going to have that double curvature that lets the dome work. So here, a very, very early project by Ove Arup for a, a factory in Wales, uh, where you can see that the, the dome is composed of a very, very thin, again, about three inch thick concrete shell. And because it is curved in two directions, uh, it, 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 it has to actually split the concrete if it's going to flatten out. And so there is uh, lots of reinforcement at the edges. You can see that these uh, skylights here tend to function uh, a little bit as a stiffening beam. And then you can see that down here, uh, there is clearly going to be a lot of steel reinforcement, a lot of tensile reinforcement there that's going to hold the corners of this uh, spherical but square in plan uh, roof together, right? Holding the corners in, uh, resisting the analog to the hoop stress that we see in a dome means that even though it's very shallow, uh, this shell, this kind of partial dome is going to carry uh, its own dead weight along with whatever snow uh, they're anticipating on the top across the surface of the dome uh, down into the edge stiffening beams uh, and into the, the sort of um, uh, slanted uh, arched buttress columns that you see here down into the foundations. Principle again, double curvature, provide tension to maintain the double curvature to prevent it from uh, flattening out and splitting, uh, and have a compressive load path that can take the dead weight all the way down into the, into the foundations. That double curvature can be very subtle. Uh, and here, I think one of the most kind of intriguing uh, examples of, a, of a sort of a, a dome with very, very different dimensions uh, in the two directions by Algos Pere, uh, 1952. These are thin shell hangers, thin and light enough that they were actually cast on the ground and then 
winched up into place. And if you look, you can see that they have double curvature. They have a positive curvature in the long direction, and they have positive curvature on a much tighter radius in the short direction. And what this means is that um, they can carry uh, their own dead weight in compression down basically the surface of the dome, or the, we'll call it a dome, right, even though it's, it, it looks more like an arch. Um, because it is such a long, shallow dome, it is still going to have some thrust at the end, and you can see that there are two sets of tension beams, or tension columns, sorry, that, that actually hold the corners together. So there's a long one here, and what that's doing is it's taking the tendency of this uh, roof to flatten out, and it's balancing that with the tendency of this roof to flatten out. So over the course of maybe four or 500 feet, long steel cables are actually holding the, the corners there together. And there's a similar uh, tension element here that is balancing the tendency of this final shell to flatten out against this one to flatten out. So those two sets of tension elements literally holding the, uh, the, the long spanning arches together and also holding the short spanning arches together. And you can see here on the inside, these are also tension elements that again are helping to transfer the, the flattening out tendency on one side to balance that out uh, against the other. Again, double curvature, curved this in the same direction in this case, but to very different radii. Uh, a secondary structure that holds the corners together, that keeps that from flattening out, that, that makes that doubly curved surface hold its shape. Uh, and then columns uh, at the edges that help to, to carry the compressive load that's come from along the surfaces down into the, the foundations below. And I think you get the best kind of idea of how that works, seeing this shell up in place uh, and uh, just sitting on uh, its columns at the moment, right, without all of the kind of um, uh, walls and things that are a little bit confusing uh, showing up to, to, um, to uh, muddy things up. Okay, so we will take that principle, double curvature, and in the next piece of the lecture, we'll look at all of the various ways that we can uh, doubly curve a surface to get this shell behavior, uh, to get this long spanning shell behavior out of very, very thin uh, concrete elements. And again, throughout, we'll be looking at the kind of overall geometry, right? Where do we get the, the two curves? Are they substantially different enough that uh, we, can, we can get this kind of two-way uh, behavior out of the shell. We'll also look for the structures that help it maintain that shape, often tension structures that are, that are holding corners or holding the, the base of a, a dome or its equivalent together, and then all of the substructures and things that are holding that uh, up, that are taking the flow of the compressive force along the shell's surface, and transferring that into the into the ground and the foundations.